This time it's, I could have been a contender. Five British bikes that didn't actually reach production. On this video we're going to take a tantalising look at what might have been for the British industry had there been a little bit more money around and a little bit more time to develop these projects. And also the sheer will of course. And so here are five British abandoned products that could have been someone. They could have been contenders. Try Bandit and BSA Fury. By 1968, Edward Turner, one of the key figures in the history of BSA Triumph, had retired, but he was working as a consultant, and so in 1968 he was invited back by the current management to design one last bike for them. The 350 class had been very popular in the United States at that point, and they felt they needed an all-new modern 350 parallel twin to compete. And to that end, Turner would design a very stylish parallel twin with dual overhead cams with those cams being powered by a chain of gears. The engine was a 349cc with a bore stroke of 63 by 56 and helped by the fact that the bike was very light, it was fitted into a Tiger Cub frame, was capable of 112 miles an hour on test, a somewhat amazing figure for a 350 at that time. And towards the modernity, there was also a cable operated disc brake at the front. But the bike was somewhat underdeveloped, with the Tiger Cub frame simply not up to the job of coping with the weight and power of the engine. And worse still, the design was plagued by crank failures, because the bottom end was quite simply too flimsy to cope with the power. Nevertheless, the management were keen to pursue the project, even though their chief designers, Bert Hopwood and Doug Heal, were highly critical of the design. And in fact, their own modular concept, something later pursued by the Hinkley Triumph Company, was passed over, something which did not endear the design to Doug Heal or Bert Hopwood. And so the two would set to work, thoroughly overhauling the design replacing the gear drive to the cams with a chain, albeit with a somewhat tortuous routing, and substantially upgrading the bottom end, with this latter change adversely affecting performance, but greatly improving the smoothness and above all the reliability of the engine. By 1971, the bike had evolved into what the management at least described as a near production ready machine, and in fact brochures were published advertising the bike as part of the 1971 range. This would eventually be pushed back to 1972, before the machine was finally cancelled. By this time, the company had already produced a handful of pre-production prototypes, badged as the BSA Fury and the Triumph Bandit. In its final form, the bike was still a 349ccs and dual overhead cam, but now boasted a 5-speed gearbox and a claimed 34 horsepower at 9,000 RPM, with top speed said to be somewhere between 100 and 110 miles an hour. And luxury of luxuries, there was even an electric start available as an option. Now over the years, much has been written about the reason for the dropping of this design. Doug here would later state that the machine was dropped because there were still a number of nagging doubts about the design, not least about the rapid wear of the points, and that given the machine's ongoing issues, quite simply the company could not afford the risk of tooling up for the design into mass production. But to the general public, the design had been promised, brochures had been printed. This all damaged the credibility of the company especially in their all-important American market where the bulk of the bike's sales were expected to be. Simply put, the whole thing was a PR disaster and one that BSA could ill afford, following on from the well-publicised issues with the oil-in-frame machines. And then, of course, there was the Aerial 3. And some of the dust had cleared. Ultimately, the machine was just another nail in the coffin of the BSA Triumph concern. And today, there are only approximately half a dozen of the machines still in working order one of which I was lucky enough to share the track with at the VMCC Festival of 1000 Bikes in 2008, although understandably, the owner was not pushing it hard. Aerial's Horizontal 704 Now if you thought that BMW's K-Series were the first horizontally engined four-cylinder bikes, think again, because Aerial got in about 20 years before. Although of course, unfortunately, this bike did not make it beyond the prototype phase. The machine was of course the work of Val Page, who had earlier designed the leader two-strokes, and the machine does resemble them, but is quite different. Running as it does, a four-stroke overhead valve horizontally mounted inline four-cylinder engine of 696 cc's, which was mated to a modified four-speed car gearbox and shaft final drive. 
The single prototype produced just 25 horsepower, but this was really just a proof of concept, and any final production bike would of course have been much more powerful. The engine was mounted from what was effectively a modified aerial leader chassis, and indeed the bike does look very similar, albeit with twin headlamps. Which of course meant that that 700cc inline engine was fully enclosed, so while BMW had used water cooling on their design, the aerial team would counter the heating problems of an inline engine by fitting a fan at the rear of the cylinders. And testing of the design would be carried on between 1960 and 1962. But unfortunately the BSA management was somewhat cynical of the sales potential of the machine, which was effectively a replacement for the Aerial Square 4, which they felt would leave it as something of a niche product. However, Ariel felt that they could sell the unit as a generator set for military applications and hoped that the military funding would help cover the cost of both the generator set and the motorcycle development. But unfortunately in 1962, the military decided not to go forward with the concept and would look elsewhere for their generator sets, leaving Ariel's 700cc inline 4 quite simply with no place to go. The Norton P800 As early as the beginning of the 1960s, Norton were becoming very aware that the design of their parallel twin was becoming somewhat outdated, being pre-unit and plagued by vibration and reliability and build quality issues. So they began to work on new design concepts such as unit construction and were in the planning phases for an all new construction facility. Unfortunately the financial problems at parent company AMC would put all this on hold. And Norton production and development was moved over to the AMC factory in Plumstead, London. And it was here that in 1965, work began on the P800 concept. This was a parallel twin of 800ccs with dual overhead cams, and which also features unit construction and could be fitted neatly into the feather bed frame. But like all early concepts, it wasn't without its problems. The engine fittings did not actually outperform the Atlas 750 it was supposed to replace. And much of the cam chain through a series of metal tunnels seems an odd decision, a source of oil leaks and difficult to manufacture too. But ultimately, of course, these are the problems you encounter on an early design, and with sufficient funds, you can perfect the concept. But unfortunately, that's exactly what Norton didn't have at that point. There simply wasn't the money there to develop the machine to a production-ready state. The Triumph Quadrant Although the machine is often referred to as the Triumph Quadrant, the machine was in fact never given a proper designation, and was in fact a virtually private concept being developed by Doug Heald over at Kitts Green during 1974 and 75, and was of course a development of the Trident T160 that we see here. Heald had been given a small team and had been tasked to investigate a number of design options which could be used to carry MVT into the future although key amongst these would be the stillborn 900cc version of the Trident. Heel, however felt that a four cylinder bike would be more appropriate, especially if it was of 1000ccs, but there were a number of obstacles. The crankshaft on a Trident was a forged affair which is initially manufactured with all the crank planes lining up before heating and twisting them through 120 degrees. However the prototypes had been different, they'd used pressed up crankshafts, and they still had some components left that they could use to neatly construct a four cylinder crank, with just minor modifications to the bob weights required to allow it to run with a new offset. And the piece together vertically split crank case of the Trident made adding an extra section in to accommodate the new cylinder relatively simple. And the top end of the engine was essentially two Tridents that had been cut and shut together. But the camshafts however would be more difficult, and these were specially made by an engineering firm in total secrecy. One problem that the team could not overcome was that the gear change was blocked off by the crankcase, it now being considerably wider, so they had to reverse the gear change and crank it outwards to avoid contact with the kickstart. The completed engine was then assembled into a machine which used essentially BSA Rocket 3 parts, which they had available that were left over from the experimental overhead cam triple. The completed machine was then taken over to the Myra test track where it would hit 119 miles an hour on test. But well, this was after all a proof of concept machine, and ultimately NVT's management did not feel that a full cylinder bike was economically feasible. The Wolf 500 two stroke. The Wolf concept had been very much the work of Bernard Hooper. He had been chief engineer at Villiers during the 1960s and had designed the Starmaker engine and would be responsible for much of the design work on the Norton Commando, 
But by the 70s, Hooper was developing the stepped piston concept. This is a two-stroke engine which uses a piston which resembles a top hat, with the rim of the hat, if you will, operating in the lower chamber beneath the main cylinder in the same way that the crankcase does in a more conventional two-stroke. And this means that the engine can be constructed with a wet sump bottom end, greatly aiding both engine longevity and, of course, the cost of production. But to make the concept work as originally designed, you needed two sets of cylinders mated to each other, 180 degrees apart, with the lower part of each cylinder pushing charge into the upper part of its neighbouring cylinder. Now it must be noted at this point that Hooper did not invent the concept, although in the 1970s he was very much pioneering its use. Now the Wolf was a twin cylinder 500cc unit which claimed 42 horsepower and was capable of 103 miles an hour on test. A said to be production ready water cooled version, the Wolf 2, was developed for the 1976 season. But unfortunately, events taking place within the parent company MVT at that time would mean the machine would never see the light of day. And there's no doubt that the concept was an interesting one, with the advantages of both engines being apparent here. There was the simplicity of the top end of a two stroke and the simplicity of the bottom end of a four stroke married together in one engine. But as with all concepts, the design is not without its drawbacks. And in the case of the Wolf engine, that step piston is around 20% heavier than that found in a conventional two-stroke engine. And this would have impacted on ultimate power production. But today, while Bernard Hooper has passed on, the company that bears his name continues to develop the concept and has previously demonstrated a V4 version of the engine intended for automotive use. And various versions of the engine have been developed for use in a number of applications but unfortunately it is yet to find its way onto a road-going vehicle. Whatever bikes or collections of bikes would you like to see us cover in a future video? Perhaps you've got a bike we can use for a test drive? Either way, get in touch below. Hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, thank you very much for watching.